Welcome to First Lutheran Church of Chickasha. My name is David Thompson. I'm pastor here, and we're glad that you chose to spend this time on YouTube for this condensed version of our worship service of Pentecost 8. Let us begin in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Beloved in the Lord, let us draw near with a true heart and confess our sins unto God our Father, asking him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to grant us forgiveness. Our help is in the name of the Lord, who made heaven and earth. I said, I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord, and thou forgavest the iniquity of my sin. Almighty God, merciful Father, I, a poor, miserable sinner, confess unto thee all my sins and iniquities with which I have ever offended thee and justly deserve thy temporal and eternal punishment. But I am heartily sorry for them and sincerely repent of them. And I pray thee of thy boundless mercy and for the sake of the holy, innocent, bitter sufferings and death of thy beloved Son, Jesus Christ, to be gracious and merciful to me, a poor sinful being. Your sins are forgiven in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us pray the collect for the day. Heavenly Father, Though we do not deserve your goodness, still you provide for all our needs of body and soul. Grant us your Holy Spirit that we may acknowledge your gifts, give thanks for all your benefits, and serve you in willing obedience through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The first reading for this Sunday is taken from the book of Jeremiah, chapter 23, verses 1 to 6. Woe to the shepherds who are destroying and scattering the sheep of my pasture, declares the Lord. Therefore, this is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says to the shepherds who tend my people. Because you have scattered my flock and driven them away, and have not bestowed care on them, I will bestow punishment on you for the evil you have done, declares the Lord. I myself will gather the remnant of my flock out of all the countries where I have driven them, and will bring them back to their pasture, where they will be fruitful and increase in number. I will place shepherds over them who will tend them, and they will no longer be afraid or terrified, nor will any be missing, declares the Lord. The days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will raise up to David a righteous branch, a king who will reign wisely and do what is just and right in the land. In his days Judah will be saved and Israel will live in safety. This is the name by which he will be called the Lord, our righteousness. Here ends the lesson. The second reading is taken from the letter to the Ephesian church, chapter 2, verses 11 to 22. Therefore, remember that formerly you who are Gentiles by birth and called uncircumcised by those who call themselves the circumcision, that done in the body by the hands of men. Remember that at that time you were separate from Christ, excluded from citizenship in Israel and foreigners to the covenants of the promise, without hope and without God in the world. But now, in Christ Jesus, you who once were far away have been brought near through the blood of Christ. 
For he himself is our peace, who has made the two one and has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility, by abolishing in his flesh the law with its commandments and regulations. His purpose was to create in himself one new man out of the two, thus making peace, and in this one body to reconcile both of them to God through the cross, by which he put to death their hostility. He came and preached peace to you who were far away and peace to those who were near. For through him we both have access to the Father by one Spirit. Consequently, you are no longer foreigners and aliens, but fellow citizens with God's people and members of God's household built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, with Christ Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone. In him the whole building is joined together and raises to become a holy temple in the Lord. And in him you too are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by his Spirit. Here ends the epistle. The Holy Gospel is found in the Gospel of St. Mark, chapter 6, verses 30 to 44. Glory be to thee, O Lord. The apostles gathered around Jesus and reported to him all they had done and taught. Then, because so many people were coming and going that they did not even have a chance to eat, he said to them, Come with me by yourselves to a quiet place and get some rest. So they went away by themselves in a boat to a solitary place. But many who saw them leaving recognized them and ran on foot from all the towns and got there ahead of them. When Jesus landed and saw a large crowd, he had compassion on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. So he began teaching them many things. By this time it was late in the day. So his disciples came to him. This is a remote place, they said, and it's already very late. Send the people away so they can go to the surrounding countryside and villages and buy themselves something to eat. But he answered, you give them something to eat. They said to him, That would take eight months of a man's wages. Are we to go and spend that much on bread and give it to them to eat? How many loaves do you have? He asked. Go and see. When they came out, found out, they said, Five and two fish. Then Jesus directed them to have all the people sit down in groups on the green grass. So they sat down in groups of hundreds and fifties. Taking the five loaves and the two fish and looking up to heaven, he gave thanks and broke the loaves. Then he gave them to his disciples to set before the people. He also divided the two fish among them all. They all ate and were satisfied, and the disciples picked up twelve basketfuls of broken pieces of bread and fish. The number of the men who had eaten was five thousand. Here ends the gospel. Praise be to thee, O Christ.
Grace, mercy, and peace be unto you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Dear brothers and sisters, I have been very divided this last week between my earthly father's hospitalization and my perceived need to be with him, to squeeze his hand and give him some assurances and trying to be faithful to the call you issued and I accepted 25 years ago to preach the word of God in all its truth and purity and to administer the sacraments rightly. At the same time, trying to complete a house renovation, move and sell a house before summer disappears. Ha! I can hear the little violins playing in your minds as you reflect on the unending demands you have as a parent, caregiver, employer, employee, volunteer, or spouse. So without time to develop a whimsical outline, with illustrations that teach while entertaining <laughs> and with a punch that will not offend, we are simply going to unpack this portion of St. Paul's sermon to the Ephesian Christians with the realization that he writes by inspiration of the Holy Spirit so that his words and meaning to the Ephesians apply to every generation. Because we are one of those generations living in the world before the return of Christ, open your Bibles or your bulletin to our epistle to the Ephesians, chapter 2, verses 11 to 22. It is so important for us to understand it apply it, and adjust our thinking and behavior accordingly. For in a world of division, there is unity in Christ. You may not realize this, but we live in a world in fellowships, positions, and values that are divided and divisive. That's where you and I live. That's what we, we're mixed up in every time we open our mouth. One may think all the divisiveness is the fault of the orange man. Or, while another person might think, no, it's the demented man. But it is actually more universal than any particular fall guy. And it is not new at all. Paul writes to the Ephesians about 1,960 years ago, probably while in prison because, you know, somebody didn't like what he had to say. After the apostle to the Gentiles points out that the recipients of his letter were once dead in sin but now made alive in Christ by grace to do good works God prepared for them to do, he writes this, Therefore, remember that formerly you who are Gentiles by birth and called uncircumcised by those who call themselves the circumcision, that done in the body by the hands of men, remember, that at that time you were separate from Christ. Please note, this separation was not imaginary. It was not by failure of government or man-made religious decrees. This was a true physical and spiritual division that was manifest in many different ways. He doesn't say, you were separated 
you know, as the Jews were by the rising German Socialist Party in the 1930s, or the forced westward march of Native American tribes to the designated reservations here in the United States. Now, it is a state of being separate from the very moment of conception and by revelation, by revelation, the Jews knew this. That is why they were obedient to circumcise their male infants ASAP, that is, on the eighth day. Now, some propose that just turns out to be the least traumatic time for the child undergoing this procedure. But I propose you think of what this is teaching. On the seventh day, God did what? Rested. It was designed to be an eternal rest. God and his children, all perfect. But because of sin, our God went back to work on the eighth day to make a way for separated humanity to return. Paul continues with the manifestation of separation from God and his means of reunification, which resulted, well, as national and religious division. Indeed, how can they be a city on a hill, attracting people living in darkness to the light of the world, if God's people are no different at all from the rest of the world. Keep in mind the testimony Jesus made to the Jewish leaders. You diligently study the scriptures because you think that by them you possess eternal life. John 5 verse 39. The Gentiles, of course, did not study the scriptures, nor think that by them they had eternal life. So, there was in actuality this distinction from Gentiles. And let's just get an understanding. Gentiles at that time understood to be unbelievers in Yahweh. They were, he said, excluded from citizenship in Israel. Well, of course, because if not, that is an obvious hypocrisy. He goes on, and foreigners to the covenants of the promise. The people of God are God's people, and God will be their God. That's the covenant. And the promise is that a Savior will come from the Alma, the virgin. Now, remembering also Jesus' words, these are the scriptures that testify about me. The covenant, the promise, all fulfilled in him. So, they had been, the Gentiles, without hope and without God in the world. One cannot have true hope in forgiveness, life after death with the one true God while one is separate from him. That is, living without God, living a godless life. So far, all of this is law, right? And it applies to all people today. Now, that's not so that we can judge any unbeliever to hell, but rather that in all earnestness, we are to lead the living from the separation of this fallen and divided world to the only true and eternal unity. Paul explains in the following good news for those who look to God alone. These Ephesians 
had lived worldly and spiritually divided lives. They were full of uncertainty in this life and really in any existence that may follow for all worldly powers they knew and had experience with were selfish and their idols fickle. Paul writes, but now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far away have been brought near through the blood of Christ. They truly were far away, but now are truly near. For you can't get any nearer than in something, in Christ. Be amazed at what God does with two letter living words, such as in and is. Because they are empowered through the loving and self-sacrificing action of the God of heaven and earth. The warring separation by those who want to determine for themselves what is right and wrong, who desire to be like God, is countered by a true peace of God. And the only peace, dear friends, is in Christ. Paul writes, for he himself is our peace. This is a substance statement. Who Jesus is, what Jesus has done, and the unworthy he has done it for to make them worthy. Now, oh, dear friends, it's not smoke and mirrors or wishful thinking, but is the substance and reality of the God man. Paul reveals the accomplishments for the divided world by Christ, who has made the two one and has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility, by abolishing in his flesh the law with its commandments and regulations. So Paul takes his hearers right back to the original problem between the Jews and the Gentiles, that is, everyone else in the world. The one truth the Jews pointed to with pride and the Gentiles turned from as unreasonable and impossible to accomplish. Both pride and hopelessness are abolished as Jesus alone fulfilled all righteousness in his every human thought word, and deed. Christian, are you hopeful that you can do that? Think again. To satisfy the cost for every human failure to meet that glory standard, Jesus alone was forsaken. Christian, is there any living heathen you cannot confidently call to repentance and delight in forgiving as you yourself have been forgiven. Yeah? Well, stop thinking so small. He died and rose for all. Listen, his purpose was to create in himself one new man out of the two, thus making peace. And in this one body to reconcile both of them to God through the cross by which he put to death their hostility. He came and preached peace to you who were far away and peace to those who were near. It talks about preaching peace to these two groups, Jews and then everybody else in the world. This is a message. It's the same message for God's people and those who are yet separate. It says that he came through him. That is means. God doesn't just do magic. It always comes through something through word, 
through uh, that word connected with elements so that we have access to the Father. That means heaven. So this new man is the person of faith in Christ. This one body is the church, the body of Christ, reconciled, that is made right with God. The reason the Jews hated Jesus was because well, he went to the Samaritan, to the prostitute and Roman. He ate with sinners and publicans. The reason that the Gentiles hated Jesus is because he was of the Jews. The division and hostility between humans and our division from God is due to sin, dear friends, and sin was dealt with in the body of Jesus Christ dying on the cross. The humble sinner forgives another sinner. The heavenly father sees not the sinner, but the righteousness of Christ whom he loves. Therefore, be reconciled, be godly. The only barrier left is unbelief. And for the baptized, faith-gifted Christian, even that wall is removed. Listen, consequently, you are no longer foreigners and aliens, but fellow citizens with God's people and members, listen, of God's household, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets. True substantive and eternal unity. Consequently, dear friends, is found only in the one true church. The foundation of the apostles and prophets is none other than the holy scriptures. Therefore, any individual, wise man, scholar, churchman, or church, that diminishes the authority, truthfulness, or relevance of even the smallest text in the Bible should be considered a false teacher or at least a false church, regardless of how popular one may be. John the Baptist's testimony is appropriate here as we uh, listen uh, oftentimes to arguments that the biblical message of salvation in Christ alone is, is outdated. It's misogynistic and offensively exclusive. The Apostle John, though, records the Baptist teaching, saying, The Father loves the Son and has placed everything in his hands. Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. But whoever rejects the Son will not see life, for God's wrath remains on him. So consequently, the one true church is found with Jesus Christ himself as the chief cornerstone. It's not about good works. It's not founded on activism, and it's not founded on entertainment, dear friends, because he writes, in him, the whole building is joined together and rises to become a holy temple in the Lord. Growing your church by accomplished principles of marketing or recharging sagging emotions or good works of, of meeting felt needs is not going to build the one true church even though none of these is evil or forbidden. God does not set the Jew against the Gentile or the Christian, the traditions versus the contemporary, but joins them together as one whole building together. Now, I can't help but hear the completed vision of eternal unity that we hear in Revelation. There before me was a throne in heaven with someone sitting on it who had the appearance of Jasper and Carnelian. Surrounding the throne were 24 other thrones and seated on them were 24 elders. 
They were dressed in white and had crowns of gold on their heads. Twelve tribes. Twelve apostles. Old Testament believers and New Testament believers in one true church united in Jesus and his headship. Dear friends, this is not too big for us, not beyond our grasp, so that all we can do is to shrug our shoulders and hope that someone else gets it, someone else carries out the vocation of bringing a divided and divisive world back to God. Paul concludes our text. And in him you too are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by his spirit. Your salvation and that of those closest and yes, even those far away is very personal. In our gospel account, the disciples urged Jesus to send, you know, the sheep without a shepherd away so they could feed themselves elsewhere. And Jesus says to his disciples, that is those who are near to him, you Give them something to eat. You, ever overwhelmed parent, you, overwhelmed caregiver, employer, employee, volunteer, or spouse, you, give this generation living in the world before the return of Christ that which truly unifies the bread of life, Jesus Christ. Man. Let us pray for all the people of God in Christ Jesus and all people according to their needs. Father God of sinners and saints, the near ones and those far away, the lost and the found, how blessed we are that the one true God our Creator, Savior, and Comforter is so patient and long-suffering. We are amazed and thankful that you desire none to be lost. We are united in trusting in you alone. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Good Shepherd, we trust that we shall not be in want, for you have restored our soul with the forgiveness of sins, life, and salvation. We enjoy access to your table spread before us, for we are members of God's household by grace through faith. Help us to humbly unite in your word and sacraments as we turn from all ungodliness in the world. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. O Holy Spirit, Jeremiah proclaimed you would raise up to David a righteous branch, a king, who will reign wisely and do what is just and right. Amazingly, he would be called the Lord our righteousness, foretelling the great exchange in Christ as he took our sins and bestows on us his righteousness that is acceptable before God. Thank you for graciously creating saving faith in us through word and sacrament. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, just as you said, I myself will gather the remnant, now also hear and respond to their joys and pleas, especially for Lisa Weber's successful surgery, and may her next one in a few weeks be also just as successful. Lord, we pray for Laurel Boyd and her sister-in-law, uh, and are thankful that their vaccination made recovery swift and without crisis. We pray for Harold Moling, still scheduled for surgery in two weeks, July 28th, that it bring relief. We pray for Eli Strutton as he enters into phase three, very uh, strenuous chemo, but broken up by full weeks of uh, no treatments. And so we pray that he continue to do well. We pray for Karen Collins with osteoarthritis, Marcy Clark with COPD, Bob Walden, nerve pain, and we pray that the, uh, the procedure uh, that uh, uh, was performed a, a week ago will have some effect of doing that. We pray for Dorothea Thorson, 
It's homebound, Janelle Goulet, homebound. We pray for Bill Thompson, who's hospitalized uh, in Comanche County Hospital. And uh, though he has had some improvement, they had to install a uh, feeding tube. And we just don't know, really, the condition and path to improvement, uh, whether this is certain or, uh, or not. So be with him, keep him uh, at peace, and we pray that your will be done. We pray for Evelyn Lyle at Glen Haven Assisted, Jerome Ursuline in McAllister. Also, Lord, the families of those who mourn the loss of loved ones in the Florida building collapse as the fatality count continued to rise. So keep our emergency and rescue workers uh, that are there and elsewhere, those fighting massive forest fires across the country due to drought conditions and high heat, keep them safe from harm and injury. And though it is far away, we pray for those in Europe who have suffered great flooding with loss of life. Lord, allow them to dry out, to recover, and yes, mourn their dead. May none be terrified, though, or afraid, or be found missing from the redeemed, built as a dwelling in which God lives by his Spirit. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Bless the food of our potluck following the service, that it nourish our bodies and the fellowship strengthen our bonds of peace. Bless our meeting, the united directing of the work and ministry through this congregation and in this place, gathered around word and sacrament. Now into your hands, O Lord, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy, through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. We pray, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory for ever and ever. Amen. I would like to share some announcements with you. Uh, Dan Ramsey's birthday is the 23rd. We also have anniversary, uh, Stephen and Lisa Weber um, and... Uh, you may want to make sure you contact them and give them congratulations. Also, we have uh, the new schedule for confirmation is working well, 1030 uh, to noon on Friday. Children's Sunday School course is reopened and located in Fellowship 2. Also, there are um, things that you can volunteer for. Men, we need to gather together this summer and and work on several different projects and you're encouraged to get with the trustees and organize that. The adult, adult Bible study continues studying in times and particularly at this section we are dealing with uh, the study of hermeneutics of principles of interpretation especially focused on such in times literature. Also today we are, after the service, having our first potluck in over a year, a year and a half almost, and a voters' assembly, if you can possibly make it. It's very, very important to us. Now, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen.